Hey guys, today I have an educational video to show you and I've got a lineup of Canadian rescues. Uh, here's the lineup, there's actually a dozen uh, Canadian rescues here. If you watch my videos on a regular basis, you'll remember I did a video called, I think it was O oh Canada, and I was bemoaning the, uh, the misfortune of Canadian law that says basically if you didn't register your bring back, these are all World War II bring backs from Canadian soldiers. If you didn't register them back in the 80s, it's now too late. And so when the veteran passes away, the family has to turn them into the police where they are destroyed. And I did a shout out to Canadians. If you own one of these pistols, let's rescue them and save them from the, from the grinder or the uh, blast furnace. I'm not sure how they destroy it. A few people, I have to laugh because people corrected me, say they don't melt them, they grind them. They run over them with tanks or whatever they do, they destroy the gun. These were all rescued from Canada, and the good news is I have more. They were supposed to be here by today, but they didn't make it. I have more coming in, probably another 15 guns coming in. So part of my showing you these rescued guns is also to give you a little bit of history of the uh, German Luger, and I hope you'll find it interesting. I'm also going to answer a question that one of our subscribers asks me frequently. He has been asking me, what magazine belongs with my Luger? I think I'm going to answer that question today by going through uh, this lineup. Okay, this is what we call the usual lineup. Uh, and again, these all came in this week and I put them uh, according to date. So if we just look at the magazines, you know, when you go to a gun show and you see them lined up like this, the first thing you want to notice in terms of uh, what the differences are, these are DWM or Erford because wood bottom is from World War I or before, so, so starting in 1900, but these are all World War I era Lugers. One, two, three. This one is as well, but they swapped out the magazine. The first ones to use the aluminum bottom was actually Simpson. So to back up a bit, Erfurt and DWM made Lugers in World War I. They will have the wood bottom. Simpson, which is actually this gun, uh, is not dated, but this was made in, I believe, around 1933, 1934. I'll say more about this, but this was made by Simpson, was between the war uh, before the DWM contract went over to Mauser. So then Mauser, I guess they liked the idea, or maybe they just shared the idea with Simpson. They liked the idea of the sturdier uh, aluminum bottom. And then, of course, by the end of the war, whether they are running out of resources, uh, one being aluminum for aircraft, uh, at the very end of the war, 41 and 42, they did use the black plastic bottom, which was prone to cracking. So these are prone to cracking. These last a lot longer, but probably more expensive. But right off the bat, I can tell this is, has to be a 41 or 42. These are World War II Lugers. These are World War I. I have one more over here, which is World War I wood bottom, but that's a Navy, so I'll save that to later. Let's go through these pretty quickly, and also I'll let you know, these are all fairly average looking guns. Now, usually when I bring you guns, I like to bring you the best of the best, and I wow a lot of you. But then some of you will write to me and say, don't you have any that are affordable? Uh, these may be more affordable. Prices, unfortunately, continue to go up, even um, guns from Canada. Uh, but here's an example. Obviously, it's an Erfurt. The DWM logo, by the way, looks like this. And you'll see DWM uh, military Luger starting in 1910. You can see the date, 1911, 1912. You can see the date. This, however, is an Erfurt. So only two contracts. DWM was by far the largest. And then Erfurt also helped out. Uh, because uh, in World War I, they needed as many as possible. You see the date is 1916. It would be in 9 millimeter because it's military. Uh, those are what we call the proof marks. And, and it actually uh, is hard to see, but it's a crown, usually a D or a G. There was a crown S. Uh, they put them on the side here. And so we know this is a military Luger in 9 millimeter, and you will see that crown proof on all the various parts. There's a crown proof here, crown proof here. Uh, they are hard to see. Uh, even the uh, side plate will have the crown proofs. That's why I keep this handy. Uh, has a little light on it. What magazine goes with this? Assuming you don't have the matching mag, and this is, uh, ends in 20. Oh, 9420. Oh, how about that? Uh, this, this magazine 
is 9420. And you see the proof mark underneath the uh, serial. That is also the crown D. Um, and there's a crown. That's Erford put them in two spots here and here. So this is the original matching magazine for this gun. There is the uh, 9420. And so obviously if it's matches, um, then that's the right magazine. However, if you're trying to put together a magazine, then any blank magazine or any magazine that's numbered but has the Erford proof, the crown D here and here, uh, would be fine for this gun. And by the way, the grips will be numbered and also crown D proofed. Now, if you want to quibble with me on whether or not that's a D, go right ahead because they're very hard to read. The G, the S, the D, and there was some other. They're, all they are are proof marks. What you want to see is an imperial proof. As a matter of fact, on this straw small part, you can see the, the uh, imperial proof, imperial proof. So they're all over this gun, and this matches. Now, this may, the first two digits look like they were overstamped. That's not like a clean strike. Some people might want to debate whether or not that was quote unquote messed with, but um, it does look like a correct magazine. Let's keep moving. Okay, so moving right along, here is another uh, World War I Erfurt. And you can see again the Imperial proofs in all the same places. This one is 1918. Um, I think this was 16, I said, yeah. So we have a 16, and they started, Erford started in 1914. They actually made a 1914 artillery model. Here's one, uh, a picture of one here, but Erford made a 1914, and DWM also made them from 1914 up to 1918. Um, this is a 1918 uh, standard military. You see the Imperial proofs, again, nine millimeter. Now, one thing that's a little confusing on this one, I asked myself, has it been refinished? Because remember, it's supposed to have straw small parts, and these are blued. Um, and I'm fairly certain this is blued. It's hard to tell because this could just be corrosion like that. I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but this could have been re-blued a long time ago uh, because see how these are blued parts, and they should be yellow. The extractor, uh, which by the way has an imperial proof, and this extractor is blued. So I'm thinking this is a very old reblue, and the reason I say very old, you can see how it's all turned brown, a patina. This one, in spite of being um, most likely an old reblue, it also has a matching magazine. I'll just put the light on it. And you see this plus mark under, uh, look for the plus mark, and then also the imperial proof. The plus mark is the spare mag. The first mag would not have a plus mark, but we see here that this one has the plus mark. So this was actually the second matching magazine. And this one, a much bigger plus mark, but this is the second matching magazine. This one here does not have the uh, plus mark. So this was magazine number one. And in fact, this one does not match. And yeah, this is 4444. Four, four, four and this ends in two zero. So non-matching magazine, uh, we do see the straw parts. This is also a, an Erfurt, must have been a sale on Erfurt's, and that's 1918. But this is a typical World War I era Luger, and again, uh, rescued from destruction in Canada. Now, I'm moving into a more complicated uh, arena because now this is going to be between the wars. At the end of World War, one. The Treaty of Versailles ver forbid um, Mauser and, and actually uh, Erford stopped making uh, Lugers altogether, but Mauser uh, was forbid to make new Lugers. Uh, they couldn't make long-barreled Lugers as in this Navy. I'll talk about this next. They couldn't make artilleries or navies, um, but everything uh, was then reworked in, in the 20s uh, and reissued, either reworked and reissued as a uh, foreign sales, so a lot were sold to the United States or other countries, uh, but also they were reworked for the police and the military. But generally, uh, Mauser was not making any new pistols. They were just reworking the old ones. I wanted to show you uh, this Navy because it is a World War I beautiful example. This is not a rescue. I took this from my collection because I wanted you to see the Crown M, which is the Navy marking, the beautiful straw finish, beautiful straps, um, but one thing, and this also has the actual Navy base where it was sent, 
Um, but the one thing about this magazine, the Navy magazines, you see the concentric circle. Here's another one. Um, there's few exceptions, but the concentric circle is usually a Navy magazine. So if you have a ma Navy gun, uh, this one may be matching. Let's see, it's 6235, and the serial number is 6235. So this has, this is a Navy uh, Luger. It's actually a model 1906, and the reason I say that, there's no date here, but it is a... Um, uh, model 1906 because it has the grip safety um, along with the standard lever safety. So model 1906 Navy in beautiful condition. I want you to see that because after the Treaty of Versailles, they, they no longer were allowed to have the extended barrel. It's kind of funny because it's gone full circle. The extended barrels are deemed more safe because you can't hide them as well. And so in some countries, the, well, to import to the United States, you have to have at least a four-inch barrel. Um, but this is a uh, six-inch barrel, and then the artilleries are just a little bit longer. And this magazine, which is Navy Concentric Circles, also has the Navy marking, which is a Crown M. And we know that this goes with my Navy Luger. And therefore, if I needed a replacement or I needed a second magazine, this would be the proper magazine for a World War I, World War I, remember, wood bottom, Navy, concentric circles. Uh, this would be a magazine that I would put with this particular gun. I wanted to show you that Navy because that's this is proper and unmessed with, but here's one that was reworked. So. Uh, here's a good history lesson. I, I hope you guys find this fascinating. I think it's really cool. And reading a book is so much duller uh, than um, watching, actually looking at them. So what we see here is, see the Navy markings right there? So this was a World War I. It would have come with a wood bottom, by the way, at the time. Uh, World War I Navy Luger. You can see the markings. So we have a World War I Navy Luger. This one, at the end of the war, according to the Treaty of Versailles, was reworked. Now you see 1920. Um, 1920 probably started out as a date, but it actually is just a rework mark. They had to prove, when the inspectors came in, they had to prove that they were reworking or getting rid of all the old stock, and, and basically if a gun was bad, they uh, recycled or got rid of it. Uh, but if it was still a viable gun, they would rework it. So they changed out the barrel to a four inch barrel. Uh, it still has the Navy marking on it, so it's a reworked Navy. They also have O, Oat C, um, the East Sea, and the property mark. It went to the Navy ba base, which was considered the East Sea. I believe that's the Baltic region. Uh, this is where it was issued to. Uh, but again, it was after the war, it was reworked, and I don't see an export mark on it. If it was marked Germany, that would mean it was exported. Um, but this was reused after the war. You can also see on the frame that this is an altered navy. I'll show you what I mean. They altered the, uh, the safety lever. Here has the same thing. It used to have the safety mark here, but they altered it. So this is an altered navy frame. This is an altered navy frame, navy markings. And I'm not sure who it eventually went to, but it is DWM, Mark 1920 meaning it was reworked after the war. When I say I'm not sure who it went to, it means like after it was reworked, it, I'm not sure who it went to. Uh, there's no other evidence on this other than it's an original Navy that was reworked. Now, let's take a look at this one. This is more common what you see when it was reworked. So this is a 1918 DWM. And then it was reworked 1920 or sometime thereafter. Again, 1920 doesn't always have to mean the date it was reworked, only that it was reworked as part of the post-war, again, Treaty of Versailles requirements. So this one was a military gun. There you see the military imperial proofs. But then it was reworked for the police because you see the police seer safety. We've talked about that in other videos. It actually had the uh, magazine safety here, you see the cut, and then under here it was cut, but that was later removed. This is the police safety, so it was reworked after the war and reissued to the German police. This could be the police unit, SD, which often means state security. 
Um, I'm not sure that that's what it means in this case, but it's a unit mark. SD could be state security police. And they added a magazine. Now this magazine is pinned, meaning I'll show you the difference. The early magazines were nickeled and then later they were changed to blued uh, tubes, nickeled tubes versus blued tubes. They were pinned here, meaning if you want to take the bottom out, like if I wanted to change the spring, I would have to push this pin through, remove the bottom, and then I could change out the in interior parts. But then in 1941 and 42, they changed the pin from here to here. Using that clue, and somebody boogered this one up pretty bad, uh, this was reworked in probably the mid to late 20s. It was reissued to the German police probably in the 20s or 30s. And at some point, uh, somebody took a, a magazine from 1941 or 1942, and they used one that was pinned in, in, the, in the circle as opposed to the original one with the pin over here. Okay? This magazine does not match. It has an Eagle 37 and it does not look like a police magazine. So probably this was not a proper magazine. Somebody just put it in there because it worked fine. Uh, made, it was made by Sauer, according to the proof mark, and it was made in 41 or 42, just by the clues that I see. And if I was that, um, that viewer who got this uh, gun and said, you know what, this is the wrong magazine, what one should I get? This one right here. We've got a nickel tube. It's pinned on the side there, but this is a police magazine. First of all, you can tell the font is bigger, which means it was not done at the factory, it was done at the police arsenal. Font is much bigger. That's a police, that's not a factory mag, it's a police mag. And the police, remember I showed you the plus sign for the spare? The police numbered them one and two. The police were the only ones who did that, as far as I can remember. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but a police magazine will be marked one, or two, and also this is a pol police proof mark. It is, a, I believe, a Eagle B, uh, but they also have different inspectors, so there'll be Eagle L, Eagle C, Eagle K, uh, but that's how the, that's the police Eagle number two. This is definitely a police magazine and would be more proper for this gun because this ended up as a reissued police gun from a World War I DWM Luger. Okay, the next one in line is one of the more fascinating stories uh, of the lot. Now, also probably the most expensive on the table, other than that Navy. Remember I showed you a Navy from my collection. This, that was not a rescue. This is a rescue and a very valuable gun. Uh, it was made by Simpson. Now, early Simpsons, you'll see the logo right here on the toggle, and it says Simpson. But then later on, I guess um, trying to save costs or um, save time, all they did was stamp it with an S. Now remember, Simpson is spelled without a P, and Simpson, uh, the owner, was it was owned by a Jewish family. Uh, Simpson was making bicycles and things like that. They did a lot of uh, metal work, and I, I know I think they actually made parts for cars, uh, but I know for sure they made uh, bikes. And they tried to get a contract to make Lugers, but um, the the Luger contract was really tied up by Erford and. DWM. After the war, the German army was getting a lot of recycled guns, but they also, particularly in the 30s, were starting to build back up again. Hitler had not come to power yet, uh, but he did come to power in 1933, uh, end of 33, early 34, and that's when the Simpson contract ended. So the contract went to Simpson to, to make some new Lugers. Some of them went to the military and some went to the police. The story is told that the reason that they gave contract to Simpson was because they wanted to thumb their noses at the other conglomerates. The military conglomerates, those, those were the ones, the companies like DWM and Erford and a lot of other companies, uh, Mauser as a matter of fact, they all made uh, weapons for World War I. And so the allies, the inspectors wanted to punish them. And so they said, you can't, we're not gonna come to you anymore. We're gonna dissemble your ability to manufacture we weapons. And the new contract, lo and behold, went to a Jewish family, Simpson. Now, some of that might be uh, just folklore. Um, some of it may be true. It's hard to know, go back in time and know what people's motivations were, but I've read several sources that basically they were thumbing their nose or in a sense giving them the finger by giving 
uh, this contract to the Simpson family. It didn't last for very long. They made Lugers uh, from about 1930 to about 1934. And then when Hitler came to power, he said, no more Simpson Lugers. Uh, and the, uh, the family was deported and the factory was taken over eventually by Krigoff. So when you see a Krigoff Luger, here's the logo of a Krigoff Luger, and I don't have one. I have rescued Krigoffs out of Canada, but not in this lot. The Simpson factory then went to Krigoff, and you'll see some similarities between the Krigoff Luger and the Simpson Luger. Let's take a look at this one. Okay, so um, the first and foremost, the Simpson was the first one to use the aluminum bottle. So it's a nickel tube and an aluminum bottom. This magazine happens... If you look at the serial number of the magazine, it matches the serial number of the gun. Again, they made them for the police, and they also made them for the military. This was a military contract, a very rare Luger made by Simpson. And you see, it's like a Droop Wing 6. Now, if you compare the Droop Wing 6 to a, um, a Droop Wing L2 or Krigoff proof, here's a Krigoff proof, uh, the proof mark is, is very similar. Maybe that's just a coincidence, but um, all the parts from Simpson went to Krigoff, and so Krigoff was using up the parts. So way too much detail for you guys, but uh, for example, the, the frame on the Krigoff and the Simpson are very similar. Uh, there's uh, different aspects. Actually, these grips, the, the uh, grips are a little bit wider. You can't really tell, but the grips are a little bit wider on the Simpson. And the early Krigoff grips were a little bit wider. So there's a lot of similarities between the Simpson manufactured Luger and the Krigoff manufactured Luger. And this is an example of a Simpson Luger probably made in the 1933 or 1934 range. Again, 9mm, beautiful gun, straw small parts. Once Hitler came to power, he took the contract. He actually, as I said, deported the family, took the contract away from Simpson and now um, asked Mauser to begin making uh, weapons of war, and German Lugers in particular. Interestingly, again, more, maybe this is just uh, uh, folklore or this really happened, but from what I read in several books, Mauser didn't want the Luger contract. Uh, remember, Mauser was already making the broom handle. They were making rifles. They had their hands filled. DWM had not been making any Lugers, uh, but had a lot of spare parts. And so the, the owners of both DWM and Mauser sat down and agreed that all of the Lugers, all the Luger production would go from DWM over to Mauser. And so reluctantly, and there is actually, actually it's not folklore, there's uh, actual letters that have been translated, you can read them in the original German, where the Mauser people say, we don't want the Luger. <laughs> it's, uh, it's too costly, there's too many moving parts, it's too complicated, we want to develop a new era of, of sidearm. Um, and they were getting rid, of, getting rid of the broom handle as well. They wanted to develop something else. But the powers that be said, no, you are going to make the German Luger. It's known throughout the world, actually famous throughout the world, as one of the best handguns. So Mauser was ordered to pick up production. 1934 was the first Mauser Luger to be made for the military by Mauser. This S42 is the Mauser code. They no longer put dates on them and put the name of the factory. Now Hitler was trying to hide from the inspectors. Remember Treaty of Versailles? He was hiding the production information from the inspectors, so he went with a K-date and the code S42. Nine millimeter, shorter barrel. This one does not have a matching magazine. In fact, it's not even the correct magazine. So let's go back to our viewer's question. This is a straight wing 63. Which magazine goes with this K-Date? Well, all you have to do is look at the proof mark. There's actually two different proof marks, but let's just go with the B90 proof. If I wanted this to be more correct, first of all, I'm never going to find the matching magazine. Next best thing that I want to do is find a B90 proof, and lo and behold, because I'm Legacy Collectibles, I have stuff like this. And you can see here, there's the B90 proof and the B90 proof. So whenever you have a gun and you want to know what magazine, or for that matter, what tool goes with this gun, you want the same proof on the gun to be on the magazine. Again, you're not going to find matching, but there's the B90 proof on the magazine. So this is actually a, this is a K-Date magazine. Uh, but also, what about the tool? 
The tool also has a um, proof mark on it. In this case, see that that's an Eagle L. This is a police tool. And if I was putting a rig together with that other police gun, this would be the ideal tool to put with a police gun. It, you see here, here's a picture of a B90 tool. They're very expensive, very rare, because they only made 10,000 Lugers in 1934. This is 1934, only made 10,000. So the proper magazine for this would be a B90 marked. I'm not gonna mess with history though because it came with this magazine and this actually goes to a later gun. It has a blue tube, it should be nickeled, and it goes with a later gun, I'm gonna guess 1937. All right, let's keep moving. This one's gonna to speak to us as well. Uh, so the first was the K date, then there was a G date, which is 1935. Here's a picture of the G date. So you have K date 34, G date 35. Then in 36, Hitler said, screw it, I'm not going to try to hide my production. Uh, he just flaunted the rules and went ahead and dated them. Uh, so 1936 is the first year Mauser began to date them. You can see it has straw small parts, very faded, by the way. And you see the pinned magazine. So now that you're watching my videos, you're going to say, that's the wrong magazine because they only made the pin uh, here. That pin should only be 4142. Um, what, what magazine goes with this gun? Well, there you see a Droop Wing 63. And so what I want to do is get a magazine that it has a Droop Wing 63 proof on it, and here's a picture of what one looks like. So Droop Wing 63 is the proper one for 1936. Oh, let's talk about this magazine. There's a lot to learn here. This magazine matches the gun. There's a lot of words for this magazine, and some of them would be force matched, renumbered, spurious, fake. People use all kinds of words to describe this, but you really don't know for sure how that magazine got to be renumbered. Remember I talked about when they renumbered the magazine, they ground it, and you can see this was ground. The, cir the circle pattern is flattened out a little bit. Plus remember it's pinned, so it's impossible for this to be the original factory numbered magazine. And also take a look at the fonts, not even close. The renumbered gun is Renumbered gun is uh, a much bigger font. And the proof mark, there is none. So there's a lot of things wrong with this. Um, 36, it should be nickel, and it's not. It should not be pinned there. It should have the droop wing 63, and it shouldn't be ground and renumbered. Whether or not that was done in order to fake, like most people assume, oh, it's fake. But that may not be, because after the war, the French, the Belgians, East Germans, the West Germans all reused these guns and often they were sent to a police arsenal which would grind it off and renumber it. So it's not necessarily intended to fake, but it's not a factory numbered mag. And therefore, when I price them, I price it as a non-matching mag because it is not a correct factory issued mag with the same number. It does match, but it's not correct factory numbered. Told you you guys would learn some stuff. Here we go. Let's, uh, now we jump to 38. We're still using the S42 code for Mauser. It's dated right here. Uh, you see this is a three-digit number, which is kind of cool. And what magazine goes with this gun? Well, you, now you see, remember I said drooped wing? This is a straight wing 63. Well, that answers the question. 38 should be straight wing. And that was the one that we had over here. Let's see which one is on here. Yeah, this one is not proof. Oh, there you go. See the two? This is a police magazine. So what I would want to do if I own these, again, I'm gonna sell them as they came in, but the proper magazine, this is not proper. This is a police magazine. And remember this one was on the K-Date, I believe. Yep, there's the K-Date. See the straight wing 63? This magazine goes over here in order to be the same year. I hope that makes sense. Only two more to go. Oh, I have this magazine down here. Oh, here's a, yeah, this, this is also a straight wing 63. There are different stamps. Again, not fake, but they did have more than one set of stamps. Here's, you have a Eagle, a straight wing Eagle 63 smaller, and this is a straight wing Eagle 63 a little bit larger. Not fake, just two different stamps. 
So this magazine also could go with this gun. Let's move on. Uh, oh, this 38 is the same as this 38. I wanted to say something about this. Um, this is an average looking gun. You can see the wear, the spotting in the finish, corrosion in the finish, grip step. Oh my gosh, totally missed this. This is Navy marked. <laughs> That's a big deal. So this one uh, was made at the Mauser factory, but then sent to the Navy arsenal. And they put the, uh, again, the East Sea property mark here. And this came from Canada that way with this holster, which is dated 1939. See right there at the top, 1939, Waffen proof. And then you see the Eagle M for the Navy. So this holster goes with this Navy Luger. The condition is kind of spotty, but imagine it was in salt air for much of its life. And that's exactly what salt air will do to a finish. This one was also rescued from Canada, but this is in pristine condition. I actually showed this in a previous video, but you see the S42, you see the 1938, you see the condition of the grips. Take a look at the front strap, what the difference, and the back strap. Now a gun in this condition, and I tell you this not to sell you guns, but to educate you, a gun in this condition, you'll see a hundred of these before you'll see one of these. And therefore, the price difference between these two guns take away the Navy marking. Navy marking makes it worth a lot more, but let's just imagine it was not Navy marked. This would sell for double what this sells for, just because the rarity of finding a gun in this condition. The other thing about this beautiful 1938 is the magazine. Notice the font is perfect. The D, the plus mark, it's a spare. You see the straight wing 63. It's a nicked a little bit, so it's hard to see, but you can see that magazine matches this gun. Uh, just a beautiful piece of history. Next one, uh, 4142, they have what they call Black Widows. Uh, here's a picture of a Black Widow, a 41, BYF 41. Uh, this is the condition we love to sell them in, and the prices have really gone up recently. Here's the 1942 or the 42 BYF. This, however, is a Canadian gun, and you can see how worn it is. Uh, the proof mark is a, a straight wing 655. In 42, it went to straight wing 135. So again, 41 is 655, 42 is 135, just different inspectors and different stamps. Uh, you can see the condition of the straps, very worn, but then also the condition of the grips are worn. So you could tell this was, as some collectors like to say, it's been there, done that. You can see the wear here. There's almost no finish here. So this would be considered a you know, a lower grade Black Widow, therefore a little bit cheaper. And we love to sell them in any condition, but somebody's just waiting for this gun uh, because it was definitely used in the war. And it does have the black plastic uh, magazine as well. The final example I wanted to show you also has a lot of history. First of all, when you see Target, in the United States we have Target stores. This gun was not made at Target. But uh, you see that target? That's an East German grip. And you can see it's a little bit different than the Black Widow. Look at the edges around here and here. They're wider. Uh, there's the Black Widow, much thinner. You can see the comparison of the two. So this is an East German uh, used Luger. And therefore, look at the font on this. This was renumbered. This is all reworked. You can see it's refinished. You can tell the finish is a, a little shinier. Look at the font on the factory numbered and look at the font on this one. Now again, people would say, oh, it's faked. It's not faked, it was reworked by the East Germans and we can tell by, by some of the parts. Um, and also, this is a DWM refinished, 1921. This probably started out as a commercial gun. There are some proofs here. It was reworked um, between the wars and then it was reworked again after the war and then used by the East German. After the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain, uh, a lot of these guns came to the United States. They would have been import marked. 
I don't see an import. Well, actually, this one went to Canada, so maybe it was an import mark. Yeah, there's a commercial proof, Crown N. So this started out as a commercial gun. It was probably reworked in the early Nazi era, and then it was reworked one more time by the East Germans. So we can tell by the font that this, this, this was replaced. It's also dented, but it was replaced. The barrel was probably replaced because it's not numbered. And finally, let's take a look at the magazine. You see it, 8024. See the two? It's a police magazine. This was used by the East German police. See the font? It's definitely bigger, but it's pinned. So this was probably from 1942, um, reworked and reused by the East Germans, East German police in nine millimeter. And then just one other thing is this holster. This is a World War II era pigskin holster, um, but there is no marking on the back. Normally there would be the Nazi symbol. In this case, it was probably captured at the end of the war. This was captured at the end of the war and reworked by the East Germans. This was captured at the end of the war and they reworked it, but it is definitely a World War II era holster. Um, and there is a spare magazine. You can tell the font, how big the font is on that. It doesn't match, but that's a typical East German magazine. And this comes as a whole rig from Canada. It's just think of the journey this went through. 1921, uh, went through the Nazi era, uh, reworked by the East Germans. They used it through the um, communist era in East Germany. Uh, it made its way to Canada. Now it's in the United States, soon to be in your living room, or so we all hope. Just a beautiful example of a reworked Luger all the way from 1921 to today. Hey, thank you, Canada, Canadian citizens, for sending us your guns. I said before, if you guys ever change the laws and allowed to get the guns back, I'd be happy to expedite as many Lugers as I possibly can to be repatriated back to Canada. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something today. I talk so much and so fast that my voice is getting a little bit hoarse. But uh, thanks for hanging in there with me. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. I've got a couple more guns I want to show you real soon.